Uh, welcome, everybody. This is my uh, my case for Agile methods. And I apologize to those of you who, who live in Europe who expect to hear the word Agile pronounced Agile. I may become confused in the middle and pronounce it both ways, but I hope I don't grate on your nerves by, by saying it in the American way, uh, by saying Agile. The, uh, the introduction before was, uh, was accurate about me. I've got one more slide that I think might give you some context about what my background is. Um, this is a bar chart that shows the proportion of my time spent doing various tasks. And as you can see, in the, in the 1990s, I was really a consultant almost exclusively. But before that, I was a, a software developer almost exclusively, except for the year that I was in business school, where I did business exclusively. Um, over time, my consulting role has, has diminished as I became more of a, a teacher and, and business manager. And in 2008, when we founded Method R Corporation, um, I basically have, have done what I consider to be putting my life back in balance, where I'm spending more time developing software and more time teaching um, and less time doing, doing the things that are necessary to, to run a business, which I enjoy, but they're not, my, they're not what I wake up to do every day. I really love the technology, and I really love designing and writing software. So that's where I come from, and that's the perspective from which you'll hear me deliver the following agenda. The first section I'll try to keep short is called Agile and Me. Um, I'll then cover very briefly five practices from an Agile implementation called Extreme Programming, which is abbreviated XP. Um, then I'll talk about some specific cases where Agile's helped me. Um, I'll describe a few things that have, that have very definitely not worked very well, and then leave time for discussion. Now, one warning, this slide set I, I prepared, those of you who, who read my blog already realized this, but I prepared the slide set for the um, Oracle Development Tools user group meeting, which happens next week in Long Beach, California. And that's a one-hour speaking slot. So there will be some slides that I may go through very, very quickly just to make sure that I can fit the entire agenda into a 30-minute period. So at the end, if you want to go back and visit something that I've glossed over fairly quickly, uh, just direct us to do that with your questions, and I'll be happy to go back and, and drill deeper. So the first section, Agile and Me, really begins with a joke. The, uh, and it's not really a joke, and it's a true story about a joke. Um, six or seven uh, friends and I were sitting around a dinner table one night in Denmark a few months ago, and we had a, uh, had a nice table, five, six friends sitting around. We've known each other for a really long time. Uh, enjoying a drink before the food got there. We had ordered already. It took 15 extra minutes or so. I kind of expected we'd be eating by now, but the food hadn't arrived. And finally, the food started to arrive, and uh, none of it was right. The, uh, the first guy, you know, I, I could hear him say, hey, I ordered French fries, not mashed potatoes. And the second person was complaining about, oh, my meat's overcooked. I ordered it rare. Well, the waiter, uh, confronted with so many mistakes, um, started apologizing to us at the table and told us that, you know, not to worry, he'll get it fixed as, as soon as he could. And one of the database administrators at the table um, piped up with the comment that, ah, they must be doing Agile in the kitchen. Um, and that's what Agile is to the, the database administrator community that, that I'm a, a part of. And it's basically just, it's one more thing that developers and database administrators have to fight about. The, uh, the relationship between database administrators and developers in the Oracle universe is not always the smoothest in the world, and I presume it's probably similar in, uh, in other product disciplines. But my job is to take DBA communities and developer communities and, and mash them together so that they can cooperate more fully, and that's really the, the spirit in which I offer this today, because I uh, fundamentally, as, as mostly a developer, but a developer who's been immersed in the database administrator community for the last 20 years, um, I really truly believe that this, this Agile thing has a lot of good to it, but a lot of database administrators don't see it because the way it's presented to them makes it completely disgusting for them. So what I would like to do is present, as you, as you know, my case for, for Agile. So the, the very first section here is really the motivation for it. Um, the first realization that I'd like you to sort of contemplate with me, and this is my own realization in running a business as a software development company, is that change is, for the most part, unpredictable, it's absolutely inevitable, it's multidimensional, it's complex, and it's a number of other things that make dealing with change really, really difficult. However, 
responsiveness to change is an advantage. Now, a lot of people don't like change. They think that their job is to prevent change from occurring. But as a business leader, change is something that you need to embrace, and it's something that you need to be able to handle well. Um, there are all sorts of reasons that things change, and I'll talk about a lot of them as we go through the paper. But being able to respond to that change is an advantage. The third realization, and this is about a, a 10 years old realization for me, is that traditional design build methods were just not working for me. There were several problems, and I'll explain some of those throughout the course of the next half hour. I happened across a book, and I'll show you the cover of the book in a, in a couple of minutes, but uh, this book called Extreme Programming Explained, in other words, XP Explained, um, has on the cover the term or the phrase embrace change. And basically within that book, I found a discipline for responding to change. Now, those of you who've, who've experienced Agile in a bad way probably are thinking, wow, I, I thought that Agile and discipline were, were antonyms. Um, but actually, I want to convince you today that Agile and, and is not a synonym for undisciplined. And if Agile looks undisciplined to you, then the people who are doing what they call Agile are just flat doing it wrong. So that's the case that I'm, that I'm intending to argue today. Now, here's a Venn diagram that's um, the, the set of all developers in the world. And I think that Agile is, is a fairly popular thing for people to say that they like or believe in. Um, but the disciplined practitioners of Agile is a very, very small subset of that, of that set of developers who say they like Agile. And, and this isn't really any big surprise. The whole world works this way. Um, everyone in the world um, is the big green, duck egg green circle, and there are few people in the world that say something, and there are far, far fewer who actually do the thing that they say. So, Basically, today's presentation is geared off of this book written by Kent Beck with Cynthia Andrus called Extreme Programming Explained. And the two fundamental core um, rudders in the book are basically that the purpose of software development is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software, and that working software is the primary measure of progress. Now, this rang a bell to me because back in the early 2000s, I was attempting to create an optimization method for Oracle database applications that would work um, uniformly across performance problem domains. And where I started was this brilliant book written by a gentleman named Eli Goldratt, who I'm, I'm very sad to say just passed away about two weeks ago. But the goal is a book about optimizing manufacturing process. And as the goal is to the process of, of manufacturing optimization, the book that Jeff Holt and I wrote called Optimizing Oracle Performance, I hope, has the same relationship to database application optimization. Goldratt's work really inspired our work, and our method is very similar. It's, in fact, derived from Goldratt's method. Well, what I found in Ken Beck's book is that his book actually has the same relationship to software development optimization. Basically, the the key of extreme programming explained is to keep your eye on the overall goal of the process of software development and basically evaluate or optimize the process based on the impact of every decision you make upon that overall goal. Now, I, I told James in the, in the preliminary to the talk today, just in chatting, my 11-year-old uh, boy is basically a professional baseball player, even though he's only 11 years old. We travel with him and take him to games all around the U.S. And there's another book called Moneyball, written by Michael Lewis, that actually is it's bizarrely similar to the other three books, and it's about baseball club optimization. So it's very interesting how many different disciplines have sort of the same approach to optimizing that, that uh, Eli Goldratt started roughly 20 years ago. Um, as Goldratt explains, the global, the global goal for an organization, whether it's a profit or nonprofit organization, is to, is to leverage its resources under its control as well as possible. And he uses the three metrics, net profit, cash flow, and return on investment as the things that you want to maximize pretty much no matter what kind of a business you're in. Um, so why Agile? Well, it's because I want better net profit, cash flow, and return on investment. I also want higher quality. This is one of the ways you get better net profit, cash flow, and return on investment. I also want more fulfillment from my developers and myself. When I, when I write a product, I want to feel better about it. 
and I want to enjoy doing it more. And Agile gives me these things. So I do Agile for these reasons, not because it's easy, because as a matter of fact, doing Agile correctly is extremely not easy. So that's the run-up. Let me get into the five practices from XP that I want to use to explain to you guys exactly what I mean when I say Agile. The first one is called incremental design. Now, one of the reputations of Agile is that you just don't do design. Um, I think a lot of people who use Agile as kind of a caricature or cartoon for bad project management, the way that they would define Agile is to say, oh, Agile is a project where you don't design anything. And that's really completely counter to how I see it and how I use Agile. And it's counter to how Kent Beck in his XP book describes it. And you can see the quote here. The question is not whether or not to design. The question is when to design. And incremental design suggests that the most effective time to design is in the light of experience. And I'll show you a picture or two in just a minute. Fundamentally, the problem that this is, um, that, that incremental design is meant to address is that plans fail. No matter how carefully you plan for the year prior to the project, when you try to create a, a, a complete airtight plan that's going to define behavior of a project team for the following five years, plans fail. Um, my wife and I built a house about 13 years ago, and we built it from a, uh, a pre-existing design where the architect allows you to stretch a closet into a little bit different shape, but not materially change the layout of the house too much. So we picked a, a pretty well-stocked plan, made a few minor customizations to it, and one day when I walked out onto the site when the framers were putting up the wood to frame out the shape of the house, the, uh, the framer... Uh, the leader of the framer company came over to me and asked if I was a homeowner. I said yes. And he said, hey, I want to ask you a question. This plan has a contradiction in it, and I'd like you to tell me whether you want me to do it this way or that way. Basically, the drawing was something that was impossible to implement in reality. If you want to think about an M.C. Escher print, that's essentially what my plan had been. And the framer just wanted to know how to resolve the ambiguity. So there are ways to prevent a failed plan from failing your project, and that's what this whole notion of incremental design is all about. Now, traditionally, and I say traditionally because it extends through the beginning of our lifetimes, but this, this traditional is only about 100, 150 years old. Back in the time of Frederick Taylor, um, his job of trying to automate production lines and assembly lines uh, meant that he needed, in order to optimize an assembly line, to separate the thinking from the doing. So basically, traditional design bid build processes have thinkers front-loaded in the project over in this domain, and then when construction starts, the thinkers go off to another project, and now the builders come in and build what the thinkers thought up. And the plan is supposed to be airtight enough that there doesn't need to be a whole lot of thinking after construction begins. Well, in the software industry, my experience is that that just doesn't work out the way it's, the way it's supposed to very often. Now, these pictures I'm showing are actually from the construction industry, not the software industry. There's a new trend, or a newish trend. It's actually how, how people used to build things 200 years ago and 2,000 years ago, called architect-led design build. And that's where the architect basically stays engaged throughout the duration of a project. Instead of the smart guys coming in, making a plan, and then getting the heck out of the project, they stick around until the end of the project. But the decision-making dwindles because as you get deeper and deeper in a project, more of the project gets constructed, and so there's less, um, there's less need for design throughout the duration of the project. And this is called architect-led design build. This was actually regarded immoral about three decades ago um, because of the influence of, of unionization and specialization of labor in, in the Western industrialized world. But nowadays, it's more of a craftsman way to approach a project where the leader and the planner stays engaged throughout the whole entire project. So the top thing in the software world is, is what people refer to as big design up front. The bottom picture represents what I'm calling incremental design. So that's the first practice of XP is incremental design that I'm going to discuss today. The second one is called rapid iteration. And it goes back to this notion that working software is the primary measure of progress. Well, I've got a quiz for you. Do you know what the worst kind of software in the world is? And the answer, it's that software that's 90% complete, but nobody can run it yet. 
And I run across this kind of stuff in projects in my Oracle work all the time. I'll, I'll see a project that's been running for three years, but no user has ever yet been able to see even a prototype because the application is 90% finished and the vendor's been paid 90% of its, of its uh, price tag, but nobody can run the application until the final bits are put together. And what typically happens in these, in these types of engagements is when the final bits get put together, then 20 people get to sit in a training course and they find out that the application doesn't scale to 20 people in a training room. Well, of course, the project's late and over budget by now, so they don't have time to fix the performance problems and it gets people in a real bind. Um, especially when the project was supposed to be designed to support 20,000 concurrent users instead of just 20. Well, the agile answer to that is these loops inside of the architect design build um, scenario or the, the method of, of doing design while you're building, these loops become very important and each one of these cycles needs to result in runnable software that people can actually get their hands on and experience how the stuff works. And when you do that, you find that the design tends to refine itself rather quickly. I've blogged um, a couple of cases. If you, if you go to kerrymillsap.blogspot.com, and I'll share that URL with you later, um, but if you look for the word, or if you search for the term messed up apps, you'll see a couple of applications that are painfully obviously not designed this way. They're painfully obviously not used by the people that designed them. Otherwise, you know the design would have never made it into production. Um, the third practice that I'll describe for you real quickly is called test-first programming. And as Kent Beck introduces it, he says that continuous testing reduces the time to fix errors by reducing the time it takes to discover them. And that's exactly the experience that I've had. Um, I don't know how many of you have, have ever been afraid, literally, to go touch somebody's code. It might be yours that you wrote three years ago. It might be somebody else's code that left the company. I, I just heard a, a quick story a couple of days ago about a, uh, a customer of ours who was afraid to go touch somebody's code because the person that wrote it had left three years ago. Um, well, that's a big problem. And it basically it, it speaks to a lack of confidence in, in in somebody's ability to understand what the code does, and also their lack of confidence that if they change the code, they won't break something unintended. This is how test-first programming works. Step one is you add a case to your case tracking system. We use a thing called Fogbugs, which is written by Joel Solsky's company, Fog Creek. Um, that case then becomes a test. It's literally a piece of code that says, I'm going to run the application, and for this input, it better create that output. Well, of course, when a new test is integrated into the test suite, all the previous tests succeed, but the new test will fail. And you want that, because if the new test doesn't fail, then the test doesn't really describe a new feature, it describes an old feature. Then you write code to accommodate passing that test, and you run all the tests so that the test will succeed. Basically, the, there's a loop between potentially steps five and step two, that, that you may have to refine your tests, you may have to refine your code, but ultimately all your tests will now succeed. And at this point, it's safe to refactor. So this means you can, you can honor the Knuth advice, which says write the thing to be maintainable, and then go back later, and if the code is slow, or if the code is, is factored poorly, where you've got the same few lines of code in 17 places throughout your application, now you can refactor safely, and securely knowing that as long as your tests pass, you haven't broken your, your functional, the functional aspects of your code. So that's what test-first programming is about. The fourth practice that I'll talk about is called pair programming. And this is one of the things when people talk about XP, it's probably one of the first things people think of. And Ken Beck has a nice way of turning a phrase. He says, silence is the sound of risk piling up. I like that. So pair programming to me is a solution to problems like these. Occasionally I come into work and I'll just completely get stuck on something technical. Maybe I'm capable of, of doing it, but I'm just not in the mood. I, I've kind of got the, the thought that, man, I, I just don't think I have the energy to spend four hours fixing this problem. And I think it's going to take that long. Some days I come into the office and I just really don't feel like making a test. I feel like writing code, but I don't feel like doing step, step two, which was create the test. Well, pair programming helps to solve those problems for the same reason that a workout buddy 
helps you not skip a day of, of going to the gym. When there's somebody there watching and you know that somebody's watching, you tend to be more careful and you tend to have more energy. This is a floor plan of the office that I'm sitting in right now. I'm actually sitting in the programmer chair as I speak to you guys. And this is how we pair. Basically, I sit here and type, and my colleague Jeff Holt will, will be my wingman while I'm typing. So he can see the screen, which is circled in red here. Um, Ron Crisco is currently sitting in the blue chair, um, wingmanning this, this webcast. Sometimes I have somebody sit over on the couch if it's a uh, PowerPoint show that I need to make sure the pixels are big enough for everybody to see from far away. But we do this fairly commonly. And I'd say that, that we pair probably only about 10% of my time, maybe a little bit less. But pairing is what we do to make sure that we're cross-cultivating the knowledge that's going into our code so that somebody else can maintain it later. And it's also what we do to ensure that the person writing the code doesn't get lazy and start skipping steps. It, it's amazing to me as a child, um, I, I grew up an only child and, and never did homework with friends, never had study groups in, in uh, the lower grades of school, so I just always considered work to be a solo activity. But once, once I started pair programming, I realized that two people in a pair get far more work done together than if they work separately. It's, it's not something that we abuse, as I said. We probably only do it about 10% of our time. But the time that we spend paired up is some of the most fulfilling programming time that I've ever spent in my life. It, it's been world changing for me. The next practice that I'll describe is called the 10-minute build. And Kent Beck talks about why 10 minutes is about the right, the right duration for all your, your automated test suites and your build scripts, whatever it is, Ant or Maven or whatever, should run. And he talks about the, the fact that practices that you, that you execute every day should reduce your stress levels, not increase them. And an automated build becomes a stress reliever at crunch time. And I did this just yesterday. I had a, a, a sticky situation where I wasn't sure whether the code I was writing was going to work. And it's just my habit now. I go to my build screen, and I build the app, and I see, does it pass all the tests? And if it does pass all the tests, but I'm still concerned about my application working correctly, then maybe I'll add another couple of tests. So. Test coverage tends to grow over time, and as your test coverage becomes more and more complete, when your test runs and passes, it just gives you that much more confidence. And here's what it looks like when the world is good. This is a, a little tool set that we, that we sell called Mr. Tools, and it's the, it's the test suite for Mr. Tools. And you can see at the bottom that build successful took 3 minutes and 20 seconds to execute, and that runs all the tests for our tools. This, uh, for example, 4119 test might have 15 or 20 command line executions within it, but it tests a particular feature of the tool called Mr. Call RM. And I know that when all these tests pass, we have a tool that's ready for release. So those are the practices. There, there are plenty more. If you read Kent Beck's book, there's, there's lots more in there than just those five practices. But those are the five that I wanted to focus a little bit of attention on so that I could tell a story or two about how Agile has helped me specifically. The first mistake that, that I want to talk about that I used to make a lot is the, the big spec mistake. Now, a lot of people believe that the way to do a software project is to write a great big spec that includes everything that you might need to put in the product. And then that becomes the plan. You lock it down. As I said before, in some cases, the project planners actually leave the project and move on to another project and start planning, planning project B. Leaving the, uh, leaving the spec for the builders to make. But in my experience, that's always been a really big mistake for me. Um, some of the problems, the, the testing is too expensive problem, is, is really about what do you do when you have a 100-page specification and you want to test to see if your software meets that specification? Well, if that spec is written in English, then it's going to require a human to read the spec, run the code, look at all the details that the spec describes and make sure that the code performs in a way that matches how those things are described in English in detail. Well, it sounds like a good, like a good thing in theory, but that might take four or five weeks. It might require a tester to create lots of innovative ways to, to reproduce the cases that are described in English. So if your test suite takes four or five weeks for a human to execute and somebody needs to make a small change in the code, well, guess what? The tester really needs to start over with page one of the document again. 
And not very many people can do that very many times without starting to skip steps. Um, the, the basic thing that I'm trying to describe is that testing to an English specification document is really, really expensive because it involves labor. It involves somebody that's willing to pay very, very close attention over and over and over doing the same repetitive task. And a task like that really, I think, is better executed by a machine than a human. The anti-gravity problem is the problem that I can actually specify that I want to levitate a four-ton object 19 inches above the ground for a year and a half. And I can write that sentence in English quite easily. But it's very, very difficult to implement that sentence in reality. And the fact is that there are really no physical laws or physical constraints on what you can write in English. That's why science fiction exists, of course. Um, but when it comes time for, for, for somebody to build it, they get stuck in the same way that my framer got stuck. You can't build an Escher print out of wood. You can build one on paper, but you can't build one out of wood. So it's very easy in, a, in an English specification, a big spec up front, to actually specify things that are contradictory to what's possible. The gluttony problem is probably pretty easy to understand. The guy with a word processor and a, and a big imagination can put a bunch of stuff into an application that really doesn't belong there. And then finally, the I know it's what I asked for, but it's not what I want problem. It sounds undisciplined to say what you want, get it, and then later decide, well, that's really not what I want. I mean, there are all sorts of gender jokes about, uh, about that kind of thing. But it's actually very common that people are unable to describe what they want until after they feel something that's close to what they want. Then it's much easier to refine than it is to imagine the perfect application from a blank sheet of paper. Kent in the, uh, in the XP book advises that you should maintain only the code and the tests as permanent artifacts, that you should generate other documents from the code and the tests. And that's really what we do. When we generate our manual pages, we generate those based on what the test suite does in, instead of the other way around. And if you think about this, it's really one of the most elemental principles behind relational design in that you want to store data only once. You want to store a given piece of information once and only once. You want the spec in one place, and you want the code in one place. Otherwise, you end up with the potential for update anomaly problems. Well, the spec, in my opinion, belongs in the test suite so that a machine can execute it over and over and over. And the code belongs, of course, nobody debates whether the code belongs where the code goes. The next thing that, that really kind of blew me away is that how, how awesome regression testing is. I used to think that only huge companies could do regression testing, and I found out to the contrary that, that even our small company can afford to do it. And in fact, I would argue now that we really can't afford not to. It makes refactoring so much easier. If you want to go in and, and change the way you factor some subroutines, um, as long as you keep passing tests and as long as your tests are, are adequate in their coverage of your product, you're safe. I mean, you're, you're working with a huge, great, strong safety net when you use tests. The incremental design to me means absolutely better design. It, it allows us to make decisions more easily. It, it makes those decisions more obvious. It's less expensive and just better. And basically, doing incremental design allows us to create much more inspired designs than if you have to sit down and imagine everything from, from front to back on a blank sheet of paper. In my experience, most code that, that people are not satisfied with is not because the code mismatches the specification. It's because the specification mismatches the need. I know I'm running a little short on time. I think we started roughly 15 past. So I think, uh, James, my, my 30 minutes is about up. Um, what I'll try to do is tell one story real quickly here. It'll be about eight more slides. And then, James, if you want to cut in and, and stop me, you can. If you want me to keep going, I probably have about seven more minutes of material before I exhaust the slide set. Oh, okay, I, I think uh, it's all very interesting, and uh, I, I don't think anybody will mind too much if you carry on. We've had some, some positive feedback already about the topic, so uh, please continue. Okay, thank you. So here is, is a, it's kind of the picture that appears inside my brain whenever I talk to somebody about incremental design and, and rapid iteration. Here's a picture of a product that I thought I wanted when I designed it big up front. I thought that I wanted the product to have a, a red feature, a, a purple feature, a gold feature, and a brown feature. And I knew it was going to take time to build this thing. So 
the distance from when I imagined this product and when I knew the product could be built was quite a long span of time. But I have a guy actually sitting here next to me named Ron Crisco who's taught me a lot about how to write software projects for, for release. And the way that Ron would do a project like this is start with something valuable that runs and then release that. So we decided in this particular product that the red feature, now I've, I've put the, the overall envision thing up at the top right so you can keep track. So we decided let's do the red thing because the red thing would be helpful. And if our, if our software tool only did the red thing, and we were to perish after creating just the red thing, the red thing would in fact be useful and usable to a lot of people. So we built the red thing. Next step, we built a little more and we released. So we built the purple thing. And then over time, we built the gold thing. And at that point, something kind of magical happened we discovered that we really didn't want the purple thing after all. After using it for some time and getting accustomed to what it could do, what we decided was, instead of the purple thing, what we really wanted was the pink thing. So instead of building the brown thing on top of the yellow thing at this point, we decided to replace the purple thing with the pink thing because we discovered that that's what we really needed. And we couldn't have known that, or at least we didn't know that at the beginning when we planned this project out. Well, the next couple of iterations were, you know what, now that we have the pink thing, I really don't like the gold thing as much as I would like a blue thing. And in the final release, we built a green thing on top of the blue thing. The design, the, the experience of using the product over time informed us that the design we initially imagined wasn't really optimal for the business anymore. And what we ended up wanting is not very much at all like what I had initially imagined. And I notice a lot of people, I, maybe there are people out there that are so awesome at, at designing things from scratch that they can design two, three, four years out into the future. But I'm just not that guy. I am pretty good at taking something that works and making it better. But I'm not nearly as good at taking nothing and turning it into something elegant. So what we've got here is three things I want to focus your attention on. First off, we were able to use the red thing much, much earlier in the, in the top project picture than we would have been able to use anything in the bottom project picture. So at, at a given point in time where my cursor is, for example, at this point in time we still have nothing in the bottom project. But in the top project we've got the red thing and we've got the purple thing. So we're at least able to, to, to use some software assistance from the project at this point. I've already talked about how experience informs the design. So the design actually changes for all the right reasons because as we use the thing, we decide, you know what I really wish this thing did? Instead of what I thought I wanted it to do, I wish it would do something slightly different. And then you notice at the end, you've got a better design because this thing is informed by actual use and experience, whereas this thing was informed only by someone's imagination. So it's better all around. You get, you get use out of it earlier and you end up with a better design by the time you're finished. So the top one I consider awesome and the bottom one I consider quite not awesome. So a few things that have not worked and then we'll open it up for questions. Um, probably the most damaging aspect of, an, of a project that is attempting to be an agile project is the absence of a customer that has these five attributes uh, acronym C-R-A-C-K, crack. If, if a customer representative isn't on the product team that's collaborative, that is willing to talk about things, representative meaning that this person has the best interest of the users that this application is going to be distributed to in mind, authorized meaning that the company has given this person power to decide yes that goes in, no that doesn't go in, committed meaning he cares, and knowledgeable meaning that the person understands what what the real needs are of the people that he's representing, then you have nobody in the project to say no, so everything gets a yes. And I've been on this project before where there's no real crack customer, and it's suicidal. Basically, the team doesn't know what to do, so it makes it up as it goes along. And most members of a, of a team, if, they, if they're responsible human beings, will try to add more and more things, hoping that this imaginary customer will be happy with having more and more things in the application. And it's what causes applications to end up having 80% of its code path never being executed by, by anybody. 
It's what causes projects to go over time and over budget. The absence of a, of a customer with these attributes is, actually, is absolutely an agile project killer. The second one, ironically, not enough customers is bad. Too many customers is just as bad as having no customer. And you've got to remember, a great design is just as much about saying no as it is about saying yes. And if, if that's vexing to you, think about the iPod. Think about a device that does not have an on-off switch. Right? Somebody had, you know, Jonathan Ive and Steve Jobs decided that they were going to that they were going to publish a device that didn't have the most elemental switch that every other device on the planet had, but they designed it simpler and more elegantly because they knew what features to say no to. And they knew that an on-off switch was actually superfluous. This, the product ought to be able to know when you need it on and when you need it off by itself. The next one is cultural mismatch. Agile is all about decentralization of responsibility and accountability into the hands of the people who are technical enough and knowledgeable enough to be able to do the job correctly. If you try to do an Agile project in a centralized organization, unfortunately all you end up with is hypocrisy. What you end up with is a centralized organization that can't let go, trying to claim that it's letting go, but it's not. Agile requires openness and honesty about where the failures are. If you're, if you're in one of the, the types of projects that, uh, that the management cannot stand to admit that anything is imperfect, then Agile's not for you. Because basically the whole key about Agile is that you want to try to find out where the failures are as early as possible so that you can redesign and surmount them. Let me see real quickly. Yeah, let me let me wait on on that until until James hands it over to me. Um, the final slide is about talent mismatch. I mean, basically, if you have a team that's not disciplined or not self-disciplined, and you try to integrate agile, what you'll end up with is chaos. What you'll end up with is the joke about they must be doing agile in the kitchen. Basically, on an Agile project, the participants have to be good at design. They have to be good at optimization. And sometimes they have to even be good at, at process optimization. Sometimes they have to be able to look at what they're doing and decide that, guys, in order to do this, we need to do it a different way. Um, a key skill, and, and this is a great ending bullet for the slide set, a key skill in any Agile project is the ability to factor a project so that it produces running valuable software every few weeks. Now your N, the, the value of N that goes here might be two, it might be one, it might be 36. But basically, if you decide what your iteration length is between product releases, the ability to continually chunk out pieces of software that work, that can be installed and be run, that's the key skill to doing this Agile thing. And at this point, James, I'll turn it to you. I've got a uh, I've got a slide here that if anybody has uh, red laser or something and wants to get in touch, you can you can take a quick picture of this. My blog is on the left. The Method R company website's on the right, and here are the various ways you can contact me. Um, but James, at this point, I'll send it back to you. And and uh, I don't have any schedule constraint for the next uh, half hour anyway. So if you want to stay late and have me answer questions, I'll be delighted to do it. Thank you very much, Kerry. Uh, I think originally we said we would uh, kind of hand back over uh, and, and look at contact details, uh, but uh, I think it would it would suit better if we, if we go straight into the the Q and A. Uh, and of course, we uh, we can change our mind to the fact that we've got an, an agile presentation. So I think it's quite apt that we uh, we do something that's better for the for the audience. Uh, so there have been a, a few questions so far. Uh, so I'll, I'll run through these now. Uh, but please, if you've got any questions at all about this this particular topic, uh, if you can type them into your, your question box uh, and then we'll answer those and we'll provide full contact details for both uh, Carrie uh, and, and Redgate at the end of the, the presentation. So I'll come to the, the first question. Now, James, I uh, I don't see any uh, any questions in the configuration that I've been given in GoToWebinar, so 
if, uh, if, if I'm supposed to see something I don't. No, it's okay. So, I'm gonna, so, so the first question we have is from uh, Rockinda. So thank you, Rockinda. Uh, on the legacy product, waterfall methodology is used, uh, and we are going to move to Agile sh stroke Scrum. Uh, what are some of the things we should be careful of or look out for? I think the, the last section... And I'll, I'll go back to, to a couple, these two, the cultural mismatch issue and the talent mismatch issue. There, there's a really good blog post that I saw a few days ago. Um, I tweeted it. So you might, you might hit my tweet stream. And again, my Twitter address or Twitter handle is this one. Um, and the blog post was, was called Briefly About Agile. And the way the blog post started off, said, when I hear, quote, agile, I hear cargo cult. I don't know how many people on the, uh, on the webcast uh, know what cargo cult is, but it's, uh, yeah, it's seldo.com, S-E-L-D-O.com, and it's a blog post called Briefly on Agile. And the blog says, when you say agile, I hear cargo cult. And it's a very short blog post that says, basically, a lot of people who implement agile are really only implementing the things that are their favorite sounding parts. You know, they might implement the idea that oh, we don't need to write big complicated documentation. Well, the problem that not writing big complicated documentation solves is that you don't have to have a big complicated team that's got big complicated integrations with your development team who are constantly updating um, big complicated documentation. Okay, so that's one problem solved. But if you don't have anything to replace that big complicated documentation, for example, you don't have a comprehensive high coverage test suite, then you've got a huge gap in your project. So what I, what I see happening at a lot of sites that call themselves agile, but really they're not following the disciplined practices of having an integrated test suite that runs within 10 minutes of of, of clicking the build button, for example, what, what's happening is they're taking what they like, but they're not taking the part of the process that actually requires hard work that actually fills in for the, the, the part of the process, the part of the waterfall process that they're taking out. So what I'd advise you to do, the biggest, the biggest pitfalls, again, and I'll, I'll page back up to these, are if the team are not capable of doing design or not empowered to do design by their organization as they work, then Agile is not necessarily going to end well. And if the culture of the company that's doing the project doesn't, doesn't allow for failure, I mean, basically Agile is about failing fast so that you can fix it quickly. Right? It's not that your goal is to fail. Your goal is that if a design element is destined to fail, that you fail quickly so that you can fix it early so that your product can have a better design sooner. Well, if a company or a company's leadership is culturally opposed to anything having to do with failure or admission of failure, then Agile is really going to be difficult to pull off. So those are probably the two biggest things that I can say to look out for. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, so the next question is from uh, Martins Adekote. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, and it's, what are the limitations and advantages of agile application design compared with ITIL or waterfall in software application design for de development and deployments? So, James, if you'll help me remember the first couple of words in the question. So it's, it's what are the limitations uh, and advantages. I, I think we've obviously we, we've touched on quite a few of the advantages, so it'd probably be quite good to to hear your thoughts on, on any limitations of agile application design compared uh, with ITIL or Waterfall in software application design for development and deployments. Well, I feel like I've partly covered that as as I've as I've talked. One of the limitations of of agile is that you have to really have a different staffing mix than you can in a, in a more um, upfront planned type of, of, of a project. Um, there's a really good book called Balancing Agility and Discipline. It's written by Barry Baum, who was one of the, uh, one of the original authors of, 
ITIL type type methods, and um, its co-author is is named Richard Turner, and they talk in, in a great bit of detail about what your project staffing mix has to be in order to pull Agile off properly. And you basically have to have much more senior, much more mature, um, but much more out of the box thinking project participants on an Agile project than if you have a, a more traditional waterfall type project. Because remember, what waterfall is intended to do is to take large groups of people who are not necessarily that inventive or, or highly trained, in other words, people that don't cost as much, um, and and allow them to get something nice done. So the advantage of, of waterfall is that it's an attempt to separate thinking from doing. So you put the highly paid, very expensive thinkers at the front of the project, and then you try to release them as early in the project as you can to save on costs, and then you pass off the work to people that don't that don't cost nearly as much. And if you think about the construction industry and things, that's, that's how you tend to think the highways get done. You know, you've got somebody in an office who's drawing up pictures and thinking about queuing theory and thinking about where do I place the traffic lights. You don't want your builders out there just kind of throwing stuff up and seeing if it works. So you need an architect. But then as the build progresses, if it's a project that's been done 6,000 times in the past 15 years, you can be reasonably certain that the plan's going to work because it's been thoroughly debugged. Agile has an advantage in applications that are executed using a plan that has not been debugged, projects that have never been done before, but it requires a certain type of staffing skills mix that you may not be able to afford. So the downside of waterfall is that it tends to sort of diminish the individual creativity that, that, that the better people on the team may have. The upside of waterfall is that you're supposed to be able to use less expensive, less experienced people, and, and get a, a reasonably good job done. So part of how you should decide which, which process to use depends on what are you trying to accomplish. If you're trying to accomplish something fairly mundane that's been done a lot of times before, waterfall probably is a better way to do it. If you're trying to accomplish something that's never been done uh, before, then you probably need to have lots more rapid iteration, lots more incremental design, lots more uh, integrated testing and, and, and the things that Agile really brings. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, so the next question is from Fernando uh, Fernandez, uh, and he asked, my team have been having trouble in limiting our scrum meetings to 15 minutes. Often we take 25 to an hour or 15. Do you have any uh, tips to reduce it and keep the discipline? You know, I'm not a scrum expert by any stretch of the imagination. I, I used to host a morning stand-up meeting um, at, at a prior company that I was at. And to, to be honest, the main reason I did that is because the culture of the company required that, <laughs> that there be a meeting so that somebody could take notes, so that, that the management of the, of the company could know what was going on in the development team at all times. But honestly, it didn't help the development process very much for us. And I've taken the advice of a, of a gentleman named Jason Fried, F-R-I-E-D, of 37 Signals. Actually, I'm sitting here looking on my desk at his book called Rework. And one of the, uh, one of the chapters in Rework is called Meetings Are Toxic. And at Method R Corporation, we, we don't have meetings anymore. I mean, I can't think of the last time I had a meeting that took longer than a few minutes. Now, we do pair up and sometimes we have three people in a room talking about something very specific and I don't know if this is particularly helpful advice but I have found that by eliminating almost all the meetings that I used to have I haven't lost anything and when I need to know something technical or I need to share a design idea uh, to make sure that it's a valid design idea there are one maybe two people I pull into the room with me we discuss it and we move forward now having said that the software that we design here doesn't typically have a whole lot of integration points. Um, so there's not like six different interface groups that need to be aware of everything that's going on every time we make a decision. But my advice is, um, honestly, my advice is to grab Jason Fried and David Hannemeyer Hansen's book called Rework, R-E-W-O-R-K, and see if that might give you some good ideas. 
Thank you. Uh, so the next question is from Jeremy Thomas. Uh, it's a question on design up front versus incremental design. He asks, isn't there a huge possibility of needing to change the fundamentals of the design halfway through when you start adding new requirements? That's one of the places where the talent of your team is a huge determinant in whether you'll succeed or fail. The, the whole thing I said at the end about, about factoring, factorization, um, Ron Crisco is, is my product development director. He's sitting in the room here with me, and his presentation next week at ODTUG is about how do you do data modeling um, in an environment where change is inevitable and it's unpredictable. Because one of the things that people talk about uh, being a, a huge deficiency of Agile, when they misunderstand that, it, you know, if they think that incremental design means no design, then people think that Agile means, well, you don't do data modeling. Well, you absolutely have to do data modeling if you're going to use a database in your project because, I mean, there's just so many things that mess up if you don't, if you don't have a sound data model. You can't have a, a high-performance, highly scalable application if you don't have a, a sound data model. And there is, though, the possibility that you get a third of the way into the project and you discover that, oh, my gosh, our data model is just not good enough. And I don't have a set of, of examples on the tip of my tongue that I can tell you about, but I can tell you that, that Ron's been putting together a presentation where I bet he has a, a sequence of them. And I don't know, Ron, if you want to pitch in. He's, he's given me that I probably shouldn't on this phone call. But fundamentally, the goal is to make sure that the things that you do design and you do lay down into concrete, so to speak, are well done and that they're extensible. So an, an Agile project in which the data model ends up having 27 copies of the same data because basically the model was just accreted by different people and never really rationalized, and never really centrally controlled, and never really um, made elegant, um, that is not what you want. I don't care if, if you say you're using Agile or not. That is, it's not a good data model if that's what you end up with. Um, I feel like I'm starting to ramble. Bottom line is, is if the model needs to change a third of the way or halfway through the project, then it needs to change a third of the way or halfway through the project. The level of talent of people that are designing the data model and their experience with doing rapid iteration um, is going to minimize the impact of needing to do that on the occasion when you do need to do it. Thanks, Harry. I'll, uh... You made the comment that you, you felt you was going on, but it's all very, very, very useful information. Uh, I have a, another question here from uh, Rockinda, uh, and it's what has your, what has been your experience with on-site and offshore development centers, uh, and does Agile work with that? Again, it depends very much on the talent mix that's involved in the project. Um, we're actually involved as a vendor. I said we do some consulting on the side. It's a little more than just on the side. We we have one very large project that's uh, it's actually in its third year of execution that we've been writing PL SQL code for a large company, and we're basically um, an offshore development team for them. Although they're also in the United States, and and we are too, but we live uh, we live a two and a half hour flight away from them. Um, so we do exchange specifications through the through email, and we do participate in quite a few phone calls with them that constitute meetings where we're having technical conversations about how the spec needs to be designed. Now, the same company has offshore teams in India that they, they have a completely different relationship with. We are, um, I guess, we're, we're a much more experienced team, and it doesn't have anything to do with whether we're in the U.S. or India, it's just that our team is experienced, the team in India is is much lower, um, much lower priced, and consists of much less experienced developers. Those guys require a spec be sent to them, and they code to the letter of the specification. If something doesn't make sense in the spec, they will ask a question to try to resolve the ambiguity. But there's not a whole lot of attention paid to trying to improve the spec in that other relationship. The relationship our customer has with us is that we're expected 
to be a partner in, in creating the specification for the software that we're writing. We're expected to interface with the other teams and think ahead so that we're actually designing along with our client as we write our code. And so we're actually, uh, we just returned from, from a, a site visit last week in which we talked about the agile processes that we use, the whole you know, automated test suite stuff, the whole, you know, we don't like documentation for documentation's sake, but there's some cases in which you absolutely have to have documentation to be able to lock down what the specification is between two teams that live in totally different time zones. For us, we don't have the same amount of, of documentation as, as the company does with their, their Indian offshore team, but again, it's because of the role that we play. Um, so I think, I think that Agile works in so-called offshore environments, but it, it, it really comes back to the slide that I'm sitting on um, with regard to what, what, is the, what is the talent that's involved, and that helps define what the level of detailed documentation that has to be transmitted back and forth between the teams, what that requires. Thanks, Kerry. There are a, a couple of questions uh, regarding sort of some extra information, for example, uh, method R uh, training uh, and white papers. If we could come to them at the end, I think that would be a nice thing to, to wrap up on sure. and where you can find uh, a bit more information okay. and, and where you can uh, benefit from, from hearing Kerry or, or also training sessions that he's doing. Uh, so moving on to, to another question uh, on Agile itself. This is from Adebayo. Uh, what is the relationship between XP and Agile? That's a good one. Um, the XP book was written in 1999, and the XP book does not have the word Agile in it that I could find. I actually searched in Google, Do uh, Google Books, and I could not find the word Agile, the string, A-G-I-L-E, as far as I know, does not appear in Kent Beck's book. Um, I subsequently found out that this, uh, the word Agile was chosen by a group of, I think, 12 authors. There, there's some more about this in the paper that, that uh, is behind this presentation, which is also available on our website. But basically, a bunch of people of like mind, Kent Beck included, and a, and a bunch of other people from pragmatic programming, from Scrum, from um, several other disciplines that had similar attitudes that, that Kent Beck had. They got together in Colorado and had a meeting for two or three days and tried to sit down and decide on what they agreed upon. The principles that they agreed upon, they, they wrote down in a thing called the Agile Manifesto. And the Agile Manifesto is, is reproduced in detail in the document that, uh, that you can get for free at our website called My Case for Agile Methods. And basically the 12 authors put their name to this thing as the core values that they all um, thought represented what, what they did. The, the word Agile really is kind of a roll-up word, therefore. I, I think of, of Agile as the, the parent node in a tree that beneath it contains XP and Scrum and pragmatic programming and, and several other methods that were created before the word Agile was created, but that all have the same sort of spirit of we've got to figure out a way to add discipline to responding to change. So the word Agile is, is, a, is a parent of a tree that has leaves that include things like XP and Scrum. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, the next question from uh, Kevin Little. Uh, how do we reconcile Agile practices against SOX and uh, HIPAA uh, and other legal mandates that tend to lead towards centralized committees and information governance? That's a really good one, and I don't know. I, I, I do believe that it's a similar issue as what, say, an aerospace company would have to deal with. Um, a place that I would look for maybe some inspiration there is the story of Kelly Johnson and the Skunk Works group at Lockheed. Um, basically, we're talking about an industry that's, that's heavily regulated. It's heavily, I mean, it's a military industry. Uh, those of you who don't know the name Kelly Johnson, he was in an aerospace engineer 
that uh, is responsible for the design of the, the Lockheed P-38 Lightning Fighter that the uh, Allies used in World War II, uh, the F-104, the U-2 spy plane, the SR-71. Those all came out of Kelly Johnson's Skunk Works operation in, uh, in Southern California, near Long Beach, near the place I'm going to be next week. And I, I know that that's a, a heavily regulated and heavily um, authoritarian type of an industry. And if you read Kelly Johnson's rules for how they did some of the remarkable things they did, um, they're very similar to what the Agile guys talk about in their Agile Manifesto and the principles behind the Agile Manifesto. So I, the way that I would try to think about it, and I don't have experience here to drop on, but I'm just trying to, to see if I can get you started, is to think in terms of, of how a group works inside versus its interface with the outside world. And the, the story I told about us and our customer a little while ago is similar to this. We, we were actually agile inside of our company doing a project as a subgroup of a company that's not particularly agile that we're feeding software back to. Now, our project has been so successful that they're interested in learning more about agile, but they themselves are not agile, but we are as a component. And it's very similar to how you implement a module and how you publish its interface are, are different. So perhaps your team can be agile and operate within its boundaries as an agile team, but if, if a document is required because of HIPAA, for example, or, or Sarbanes-Oxley, you have to create that, that document as an output of your team, and you might create that document in an agile way. For example, you might try to find tools to automate as much of the document creation as possible, for example. Um, but if that's a requirement of your project because of the, uh, the governance that surrounds your project, then obviously it's just as important of an output for getting paid as the code that you produce. So it, it just comes down to understanding what your API with the outside world is as a project team and where you have liberty to choose how your project team can operate with, within its own membrane. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, next question from Charles Markham. The older spiral methodology, as well as rapid prototyping methodologies, seem similar to Agile. Do you see major differences with Agile and these methodologies? The, um, the paper talks about that a little bit. If you, if you think about what incremental design and, and uh, a rapid release cycle means, it's very much like the old spiral or rapid prototyping uh, methods. And I, I think that the Perhaps Agile is different in that, in that it incorporates a, a broad variety of other practices as well. I mean, the, the pair programming thing, the 10-minute um, the build thing. Um, I mean, those are all really almost like ornaments on the fundamental tree of, of the rapid prototyping, um, what do I want to call it, the rapid prototyping idea. I mean, basically, rapid prototyping is about, hey, I don't know if this thing's going to fly to the moon. I don't even know if it's going to fly off the backyard. So let's create a model first, see if that'll fly. Then we'll see if we can scale it up. Then we can see if we can put a guy in it. Then we can see if we can put it into orbit. Then we can see if we can get it out of orbit. Then we can see if we can get it to the moon. Then we can see if we can land it on the moon. I mean, if you think back to a project as large as, as Apollo, for example, that's basically how they did it. They did, they, it, it may sound like a big design up front, but they did lots and lots of missions that taught them what they needed to know before they could ever design the next mission. I mean, we had to put people into orbit before we could kick people out of orbit. We had to orbit the moon before we could ever decide to land on the moon. So I, I think in the days when that happened, what they were doing was called rapid prototyping. And in the software development world, I think that's really what Agile is, is rapid prototyping. But added with it a lot of things that, that tools can enable us to do to basically, I don't know, it, it, it seems like Agile is a, is a bigger kit to me that explains how to do some of the, the, the loose end details that, that you have to do day in and day out in a project in order to succeed. Thanks, Harry. So the next question is from Inno uh, Lawrence. Uh, again, I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Uh, do you in any way capture anything in a modeling tool afterwards? 
So for example, capturing tables and putting it in an entity model or capturing business rules in code to make it readable afterwards. In the project that we're doing that I keep referring to that we, uh, that we visited the customer last week, one of the things that we're required to do is to produce a, a, an entity relationship diagram for the project team that we're working with so that they can understand the structure of the tables that, that are in the schema that we created. And of course that changes from time to time and we have to keep the remainder of the project team updated with what those changes are. Um, what we try very diligently to do is to make sure that we record that information um, in the database where it counts and then we generate the documents based on that. So it's like our source code is the actual create table statements and the actual uh, alter table statements and the create index statements. That's our source code. The documents are created automatically by using tools to generate what the schema looks like. So any pictures that we draw are not drawn by hand. They're, they're derived from the source code, so to speak, of the, in, of the create table statements that we've, that we've generated. Um, the remaining documentation, I mean, we, we write a lot of code uh, with PL SQL that I believe we're actually pulling comments out of the PL SQL to create the user documentation. We have, for example, an open source tool called ILO at SourceForge. It stands for the Instrumentation Library for Oracle. And that's how the documentation for that is built. It's basically extracted from comments within the code. So our documentation and our source code are really one and the same. In our uh, Mr. Tools product, um, they're written in Perl. And the documentation for the tools themselves are written within, inside the Perl source code. So you know, it's, it's one file edit where I'm writing the documentation about a paragraph of code that's right next to the documentation that describes it. So it, it, back to that fundamental rule of relational design, you want to store data once and only once. Well, if you have different formats in which you need to publish given data, what you need to do is figure out what your source code is for that format and then try to find tools. And that's one of the reasons, James, that, that, that we're friends, that, that Redgate and Method R are friends, is because Redgate is one of the key providers of tools that allow you to do things like, like schema reporting and schema differentiation and data differentiation. You don't want to have to do that stuff by hand. You want to be able to have tools that help you do it. Thanks, Carrie. Uh, so a question here, uh, there's a couple of quite general questions. Uh, so I want to try and put two questions together uh, from uh, Therese Maria uh, and Martin's Adakoti. Uh, so Therese is, is interested in what, what is the biggest challenge when implementing agile methods uh, and what Martin's asking is if you could elaborate more on the agile method uh, and database modeling in data, database architecture. To, uh, to the first question, the biggest challenge is to make sure that you don't think that agile is just a bunch of buzzwords and a bunch of uh, ceremonial things that if you do those, everything's going to be all right. I mean, Agile is a bunch of work. If, for example, and I used this example before, but if you decide, eh, we're not going to write a big complicated specification in English, well, then you need to write a big complicated spe uh, specification in code. You've got to fill the gap one way or the other. I'm a huge proponent that a specification should be written to be machine executable as opposed to human executable, but that takes work. And as I said before, I think one of the reasons that, that Agile methods have such a bad name among my DBA friends is because the way that they see them implemented is that people just pick off the stuff that's easy and they don't do the compensatory things that are difficult and so they end up in a rut. You know, they end up with no spec whatsoever. So they don't have tests, they don't have an English document, they say they're doing Agile and all that does is make Agile look bad. Um, <clears throat> to Martin's point, um, I think that it's, it's a much bigger topic than, than I can cover in the time we've got left, but maybe a couple places to start um, include one of my good friends uh, that used to work with me at Oracle is named Dominic Del Molino. His last name is spelled D-E-L-M-O-L-I-N-O. Uh, he's on Twitter. You can find him, and he talks a lot about, um, about database and Agile. Uh, if you just follow his Twitter stream, you're going to get you're going to get loads of uh, pointers to different sources of information. 
Ron Crisco, I mentioned before, is uh, is a subject matter expert in the same in the same area, and he's speaking next week at ODTUG about data modeling in, in uh, you know rapid iteration projects. Um, there's a good book. I can't remember the name of the author, but it's called uh, I think the name of the book is Database Refactoring. And I'll bet before the next 30 seconds elapse, I'll know the name of the author because Ron will find it find it for me. But there are places you can go. Um, out there in the market to help learn more about how to do um, rapid iteration and incremental design using databases. One of the problems is, uh, I think one of the reasons it's so hard to redesign a database model is that the tools market is relatively immature. I mean, Redgate is is early to the table, really, um, in in providing some of the tools that it that it creates for the Oracle database administrator and for Oracle database developers. Um, there's not a whole lot of good competition out there um, that helps people refactor databases. And, and there are really two big problems. One is the schema differentiation. You know, I, I just changed six tables. A developer changed six tables and needs to communicate to the DBA, what did I make different? So then the DBA can rationalize and publish that schema change for everybody else in the project. Well. Noticing what's different about the, the schema is only half the, half the battle, maybe even less than half the battle. The rest of the battle is, hey, you added a column. What data did you put in that column? So what data in this database is different based on what you, the developer, did by adding a column to this thing? Um, and of course, it's probably not derivable data from anything that was previously in the database, or you wouldn't have needed to add the column. So it's a, it's a big, complicated job to, to refactor a database. And if, 20 years ago, somebody had said, yeah, I want to take all instances of these five lines of code out of my project and turn them into a function call. The developer would have been aghast. They, they would have said, oh my god, that's going to take me three weeks to do that. Whereas today in Eclipse, you can do it in 20 minutes. Right? The tools are, are just much more mature on the developer's desktop than they tend to be on the database administrator's desktop for doing refactoring. So I'll say it again. It's one of the reasons that that I've been following Redgate because they, you guys seem to be the leader, you know, even ahead of Oracle and, and some of the more established players in the market, um, and, and understanding that these things are 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 gaps that need to be filled with good tools. Absolutely, uh, and I mean, as I mentioned at the beginning, I mean we. We have a kind of a, a very strong following within in the SQL Server, and and I think the uh, the response to our, our Oracle tools that we've received uh, quite quickly d does certainly go to show uh, that they're useful in that. And uh, I mean, as you know, I mean, at Redgate, we are strong believers in developing uh, in an agile way, and in fact, that, that's how we work on all of our projects, whether it's a, a new piece of software uh, or our internal systems. It, we really. Uh, Phil, this is the kind of sort of benefits, everything, the teams, and ultimately the the output as well. Uh, so there's there's one uh, main question left, uh, then a, a couple of other questions, as I say, about further information. And this one's from Chris Curzon. Uh, it, it's quite a long one, Carrie. So uh, please stop me if you want to sort of drop some bits down as we go along. Uh, so Chris asks, do you have suggestions with respect to programming standards at the beginning of a project uh, and he would like to put one specific example to you. Uh, one project that Chris was involved with was so focused on speed of development that management rejected his proposed requirement that all SQL used by the PHP web server be expressed within a packaged procedure. When the data model was later changed uh, we were not merely rewriting SQL but negotiating all the interfaces between the web server and the database server. Yeah. Um, that is, um, I don't know, if, if, I, if I were to write a book about 10 mistakes you need to watch out for, that's probably number one or number two. There's a concept, if you uh, look in Wikipedia for the words technical debt, D-E-B-T debt, um, that's basically a story about un, unpaid technical debt. Basically, technical debt is the, it's, it's the indebtedness that you create. Well, think about what debt is with money. 
debt with money is I spend money that I don't have, but I'll earn it later and pay it back later. That's essentially what you do when you compromise code quality for speed. Right? Speed to market means I've got to get this thing done in two weeks. I don't have time to make package procedures out of my SQL. I'm just recapping the story that you just told me. So what I end up with now is I've got SQL in my PHP. My product works. I've released it. Now we're starting to make a little bit of money because some customers like it, but they need six new features. So instead of spending next week fixing my code so that it's easier to maintain later, I'm adding six new features to my code. Well, ultimately, your debt catches up with you. There, there's, there's no more that you can borrow. You hit your credit limit, so to speak. And what has to happen at that point is you have to stop and start paying it back one way or the other. And the story that, that, that Chris told in his question um, ended kind of with the abrupt realization that, okay, now instead of something that should have taken 20 minutes to do, we're going to have to spend four weeks doing this. And that's the interest on that debt. So as you continue to leave yourself in technical debt and add more and more and more features to your product, you're basically compounding the interest that you're going to have to pay back on that technical debt. So I think it's a fantastic metaphor for what really happens. And basically what, what I find that Agile gives me is because of the, the regression testing suite that I have, it makes the refactoring of you know, getting out of technical debt, putting, putting the procedures into, or putting the SQL into package procedures and making an API, um, it, it, it needs to be done. And I, I'm, I'm a fan of releasing the product that works before having done all that. I think that's a fine idea. I think the place that the, that the refactoring needs to take place is after the project has been demonstrated to be viable. I think that the gap in the story that Chris told is his management's appreciation and understanding of what the cost is of continuing to hold that technical debt as the product gets extended and extended and extended. I think the right place to go fix that problem is not to have delayed the product's release in the first place by doing a complete architecture design, you know, to put all the stuff in store procedures. I think that proving the concept that the application works and is saleable is a good thing. But I think that somewhere between version one and version two or three, there needed to have been a feature added that customers don't necessarily see that doesn't show up in the marketing material that is, look, guys, we've got to go and refactor this code so that it's easier to maintain later because we don't want to get caught out. And there's a number of reasons that you want your PL SQL uh, uh, interface instead of having SQL sitting in PHP pages. There, there are a lot of performance reasons. You don't want to be passing long strings of SQL between a client and a server, for example. Um, there are security implement implications. There, I mean, there are horrific, horrific performance implications of that implementation inside the database. But as Knuth said 25, no, 31 years ago, you don't, you don't optimize before you make sure the thing works. And in, in the software industry, the thing works is not just does the code run but is somebody willing to actually trade their hard-earned cash for our code? So I, I really think that the place that, that the mistake was made is not necessarily in releasing before the, the architecture work that Chris described, but in continuing to release without going back and revisiting the architecture work. Fantastic. Thanks, Carrie. I just want to quickly check uh, to see if any other uh, questions on the sort of technical on, on this topic have, have come in. Uh, lots of great feedback uh, from the uh, attendees. Uh, thank you for sending the feedback in. It seems that it was a, a really useful session uh, and, and that Carrie's answered uh, the questions uh, well for you. So uh, thank you again for, for participating. Also for, for giving your feedback. It, it's really good to hear. Uh, so the last two, uh, as I said, were, were more general uh, things uh, from Jimmy Brock. Uh, and also from uh, Bod, uh, Bob uh, Stauffer. So Jimmy asks, uh, are there any public training sessions coming up this year uh, from, uh, or that are hosted by Method R? Uh, and what Bob would like to know is, are there any publicized white papers that show some de detailed examples of successful agile development projects? 
I'll answer the second one first. Um, off the top of my head, I don't know. If, if I needed to, uh, to find them, I would, I would start with Google personally. Um, I don't think I can, I can do better than that, but I, I'll bet you, well, I know. Th there's one blog called uh, agilewarrior.com, I believe. There's a reference to the right URL in my paper. Um, and from there, they're probably, well, a Google search is going to result in, in, in a rich answer to that second, second question, I'm, I'm certain. The first question, um, thank you for asking. Um, our public schedule has been um, virtually non-existent for the past couple of years, but we're going to fix that starting the last part of August. We've got a one-day course that we're creating. Basically, I'm going to get full-time on that as soon as I get back from OD Tug, called Mastering Oracle Trace Data. And that's going to be a one-day course that will have a, a relatively low price tag compared to the stuff that we've done in the past. And it's also going to include um, uh, trial licenses for a lot of our tools so that people that exit the course will be able to go home and actually use tools to do the complicated operations that we're going to describe in the course. Um, the first couple of instantiations of that course are going to be delivered in Europe. I think we're going to do Copenhagen and London probably in the last week of August, first week of September time frame. Um, in the U.S., I'm not sure what our schedule is going to be. It's mostly a constraint of where do I think we can put 100 or so people in a room um, for one day. So if you're interested in, in any of our courses, obviously I'd, I'd encourage you to go to our website, which is this methodr.com page here. Um, and I, I'd encourage you to send a note to uh, either me personally, uh, tweet me, or send me an email. You can always reach anybody at Method R through info, I-N-F-O, at method-r.com. Um, I'd love to know where the people are who would like to take the course so we can help minimize your travel expenses. But um, that's going to be the, the main focus of the latter half of this year is that one-day course. And I'm going to try to put as many people in that as possible. So anybody uh, that you know that might be interested, I'd, I'd really be appreciative if you could kind of pass the word along. And we'll be doing it through Twitter and Facebook and, and, and other mechanisms as well.